I'm Bill Sanders. I'm the director of the Coordinated Science Lab, and it's really my honor to welcome all of you to this 60th uh, Diamond Anniversary celebration. Maybe I wait a minute. A lot of people coming in. Uh, this is our inaugural event of the 60th anniversary year. Uh, I think as many of you, but maybe not all of you know, uh, CSL was founded in 1951 as the Control Systems Laboratory. And in fact, for the first several years of its in existence, it was a classified research lab uh, on campus. Um, things have grown, things have changed in many ways since that time. And um, I think it's very clear now, 60 years later, uh, that CSL was one of the very earliest and remains the, uh, uh, one of the very premier uh, interdisciplinary labs on campus. A really distinguishing feature that, that, that I'm proud of is it both fosters strong disciplinary research, very strong disciplinary research, and at the same time houses people that like to work together and have large impact on what they're doing. Um, so, so during this year, and I'll tell you a little bit about what's going to happen this year, um, we're both going to review the past, but we're also really going to look forward and, and really explore what we as CSL want to be in the next 60 years. I should say that this year's planning events are uh, organized by a planning committee. So even though I'm up here speaking, uh, we really should thank the planning committee for all the work they've done to put this seminar series and our event in the fall together. Uh, Professor Tamir Bashar is the uh, chair of that planning committee, so I really thank you and am indebted to all the work you've done. And also we have members from each of the disciplinary areas in CSL uh, that have been asked to be on the committee. So it's a, it's a broad committee that's coming together. Um, two uh, major events are really planned. A seminar series this spring and this is the first of, of, of uh, three seminars that we'll have in this spring term. The next one is on March 28th, and then the, the, the final one is on May 2nd, uh, and you'll hear more about those as we go forward. And then um, there will be a 60th anniversary symposium in the fall. This will be held on October 28th, 2011, and it will be a day-long explanation, again, of, of, of where we've come from, where we're going, um, and, and, and really allow us to both celebrate where we've been, but also look forward to, uh, to what we want to do uh, as we move forward. So I hope you're able to uh, attend all of these events. So that's the uh, general information I want to give you. Um, now what I'd like to do is introduce our speaker today, and I think it's particularly appropriate uh, to have uh, Ruj Navachi here uh, as someone who has such a broad interdisciplinary view as, as the first speaker in this uh, Diamond a Anniversary series. Um, I'm also very happy as, as someone I've known for many years as a friend to be able to welcome her here today and uh, really look forward what, to what I think she's going to talk about. And, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, I could go on for a long, long time about uh, Ruzhina's accomplishments, and then there would be no lecture, so I can't, I can't do that for to too long. But uh, uh, let me just say a few things. Uh, Ruzhina received her PhD in computer science from Stanford University in 1972. She's currently a professor of electrical engineering and computer sciences at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, she was the um, leader of the SIS directorate at NSF before moving to Berkeley. And we can all remember for the programs, that the, really the interdisciplinary programs she put in place there that put an <coughs> emphasis on uh, systems and high impact uh, applications as well as uh, really good foundational work. I know you're all standing. Just come down here and try to, this is a terrible auditorium. Come in and try to, maybe the people that are in the edges can, uh, push in a little bit so that people can put it on the side. Please, we're going to have a packed audience. Um, she's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. She's a member of the National Academy of Science Institute for Medicine, as well as a fellow of the ACM, the IEEE, and the AAAI. And so this uh, extremely distinguished uh, uh, person. In 2001, she received the uh, 
ACM uh, AAAI Ellen uh, Newell Award, and in uh, 2008 she was a recipient of the Benjamin Franklin Medal for Computer and Cognitive Sciences. So uh, this has been a long and distinguished career. I think one that in some sense is just beginning, as you'll see the, the really interesting work that, that she's going to tell us about today. Um, and, and this work is really at the confluence of uh, cyber, of physical, and of, and we've heard cyber physical, but more, most importantly, really social systems. And this confluence of these three areas, I think, is something we're going to see as being very important as we move forward. So without uh, further ado, I'd like us all to welcome uh, Professor Ruzan Abadji here, who's going to talk about cyber physical and social networks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? I mean, is it, is it on? Yeah. yeah, OK. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here. And thank you all for coming, because I know that there is a competing 4 o'clock talk in the computer <laughs> science department by Jessica Hudgens, who is a prominent uh, graphics person. So I really, <laughs> I really appreciate those of you who chose my talk. Uh, <laughs> Um, I will try to make it as entertaining. I was telling my friends Bill and, and uh, Tamir that I worked very hard on this talk because I really wanted to make it visionary, but at the same time I also wanted to put some beef underneath. So in that sense, it's, um, and I hope you will see that. Okay, so what is this presentation about? We are interested in how people and cyber physical systems interact how we can observe these interactions and model them and in turn have predictions of their behavior and performance. That is really the highlight and the, the, the main theme of my presentation. <clears throat> I shall begin with describing the Millennium Project at UC Berkeley led by Professor Alex Bayan. His project is an example of cyber physical system modeled as distributed parameter system, as an estimation. So here is just to show you that the broad in applications, and these slides are actually from Alex, so I mean I cannot take much credit except that I really like them very much. So the distributed parameter system <coughs> integrate dynamical processes in which spatial variations play an integral role in their evaluation. And they are applicable not only to, to cars and, uh, and traveling, but also to trains, to power distribution. So they, are, they, they have wide applications, and yet you know, they can be described by these <coughs> parameters that you can hopefully uh, estimate from observations. Um, what this is all about, and what my work is all about, is about inverse modeling. I am very much interested in systems identification. So those of you who belong to this building should know what that is, OK? Uh, but here is a, is a diagram of it, just so, so that to recapitulate. So here is the physical world, OK? And um, we have sensors that we observe this physical world. We extract from these sensors certain parameters, OK, at a certain level of abstraction. And then we do the model simulation. So the, so the inverse model characterizes is systems identification, as I said, and learning. And I will talk much less about the machine learning part. In general, it requires to have predefined mathematical models. We believe in Lagrange and Euler. And of course, experimental data. <coughs> Challenges include modeling errors, measurement characteristics, and so forth. OK. So once you uh, do these measurements, the sensor data on the left side, then of course, what you really want your controller to be is to use that information to control the events in the physical world. 
So the data assimilation, and I spend a lot of time on data assimilation in the physical sciences, is really relates to the state estimation. And as I said, I do much less machine learning. For the online system implementation, it requires streaming sensory data, so it requires real time, which is frequently a killer in our work. You cannot just do offline things. You have to do in real time. And as I said, there is. And then specific to cyber physical systems is coupling between the physical processes and the computational processes. And of course, it need to run faster than the physics for, uh, for the now cast so that the, it can really give you the, the right feedback system. So here is the web 2.0 on wheels. And this slide should really tell you the important component of my presentation and of my work, human as a sensor. That is very critical that this new technology that allows us to do this are all these mobile devices. And I know many of you <coughs> work with mobile devices, so I hope you re relate to this. Um, uh, just to show you, um, how fast these, from 92 to 07, how these mobile devices, the numbers of them in the world, have 3.5 billion mobile devices subscriptions worldwide in 2007. So they really have captured our imagination. And so the question is, how can we take advantage of their use? So. So these are the, the mobile internet, and we, of course, have all these different mobile devices, but we also have different, um, uh, different um, operating systems, such as Symbian and Android and Linux. And then we have different sensing and communication suite. And that sort of <coughs> tells, tells you that you have, you have different protocols. And you really need to deal with quite a bit of integration and synchronization of these different protocols that I know that many of you are dealing with it. But how to build these systems where you have all this heterogeneity, where you, know, you don't have standards, and the compatibility and how you make it work together is really challenging. Uh, it might not be a deep science, but boy, it's a deep engineering problem. And then we have the smartphones, context awareness, sensing-based user-generated content. So here is the architecture, and I will not go beyond that. So we have the sensing. Here is your, your public, you know, your, your cars. And the, the presentation that I took from Alex says work is strictly concerned with monitoring the highways in California so that one can um, <coughs> measure you know, where the congestion is and give some control from the top to advise the drivers you know, where there is congestion and where they can find a better way to get around. So what it really is is sensing millions of mobile devices of new source data, the, in this case, is really a GPS, okay, which you are, which you are measuring. <coughs> and then um, we use, uh, at least he used, Nokia, uh, Nokia, uh, Nokia uh, phones for this purpose, existing cell phone infrastructure, but you can obviously use anything collect raw data and receive traffic information. And then here you have the network provider, here you have your cell towers, and then here it comes the data aggregation. You have all these different servers, and then this is the data assimilation. Now what is data assimilation? That you take the raw data and you try to extract the right features. <clears throat> so data assimilation is real-time online traffic estimation. You basically are estimating in time the position where the, where the, the cars are. Uh, 
and of course, I see here Carl Gunther somewhere. I saw, so there is definitely a privacy management, which is really critical here because you are collecting all this information, and you worry about that by knowing where these people are. Uh, you are not breaking the the privacy. So there is encrypted transaction. There is cli client authentication. Okay, but then it's data anonymization. So that is a critical thing. And um, <clears throat> during the day today, I was talking to various people, and everybody is asking me privacy, privacy, privacy. Well, privacy is a big issue, and I don't think we have complete answers. Okay, so here is just one uh, one diagram to show you how the data <coughs> collection spatially ever traffic <coughs> monitoring there are these the, the sampling strategy uses virtual trip lines VTLs which are geographic markers deployed at privacy aware locations which probabilistically probabilistic meaning that you get some kind of a distribution over time <coughs> trigger GPS updates for a proportion of the phones crossing them and then phone anonymizes the data and GPS update is encrypted and sent. So that's how we deal with, that's how we deal with the, the privacy issues. Uh, big problem. Okay, so this is, I believe, my last slide on Alex's um, presentation. And uh, basically what we are modeling is this Moskowitz function, uh, the, which is a function of the position of where the car is, which we get from the GPS, and the time, over time, remember the time sampling which we had. And from that, that information goes to the center, uh, center server where you are plotting this and looking for a, a minimum, minimum s curve through the surface in order to to deal with the, the congestion. <coughs> so this, this was sort of what he did, uh, Alex, with his team. And then I have two more slides from him, which is saying, you know, where does, where this technology can go? Speaking of future, you know, for, for, uh, for this physical, cyber physical uh, systems as an example. So one is e-wellness, um, and uh, here they are trying to detect noise so that one can inform the driver, uh, you know, where there is bigger noise than smaller noise, and therefore, you know, uh, make sure that people can avoid places where there is too much noise. So inferred from traffic. The part where I was involved is here, which we have a pollution sensor. My collaborator, Dr. Edmund Seto, from, uh, from uh, the School of Public Health, has apparently these pollution sensors are available. And so you can put into uh, either a human uh, as he or she walks or the car to put and you can map where the where the 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 pollution is is worst and this is important for asthma folks they could be alerted so that they can avoid the the places where the pollution is is uh, uh, not not desirable so this is just an example ladies and gentlemen that how this scalable system of these physical systems like cars with the human <coughs> as a sensor having the GPS can be acquired, the data can be modeled, and can send feedback for improving their activity. Okay. Now I switch to social networks since I advertise the social networks. So as you know, social network is a social structure made up of individuals or organizations called nodes, which are tight connected by one or more specific types 
of interdependency such as friendship, kinship. These, these arcs could mean many things, such as kinship, common interest, financial exchange, dislike, sexual relationship, etc., etc. So fundamentally, we are talking about the graph. Okay, and here is an example of this graph. Okay, uh, these are very tightly connected, and they are more loosely connected, and then you have connectivity at the at the edges. But fundamentally, from our point of view, it's a graph. Okay, nothing new under the sun. You know, if you think that you have <laughs> you have discovered something. Please be humble. <laughs> Good advice. Pardon me? Good advice, right? I mean, I always think, oh, this is wonderful. And then I go and look at the literature, and, and I find that I am not the first one, sure. <laughs> so precursor to, of social networks in the late 1800, OK? Include this guy, Turkheim and Ferdinand Tonis Turkheim, distinguished between traditional society called mechanical solidarity <laughs> if individual differences are minimized, all right? Uh, and modern society called organic solidarity, if there is a cooperation between individuals but playing different roles. Okay, so the analysis, social, in 1960s, 70s, Stanley Milgram developed the six degrees of separation. Today we know that it is sufficient to connect any two people through email with five to seven degrees of separation. So <coughs> anyway, collaboration <laughs> graphs can be used to illustrate and compute good and bad relationship between humans. There are several metrics in social networks, such as betweenness, centrality, clustering, structural. So here are some, you know, and there are several others, but I found that this picture was rather nice. So, so you cannot read, of course, but here are names of, but this is sort of a pictorial uh, representation of s what they call socio-mapping. It's a visual representation of social networks. Uh, here is in a conference, who talks to whom? I mean, you know, and you can create for yourself, but I found it very, very beautiful in terms of um, aesthetics, you know, that you can represent these social networks in many different ways. Okay, what has changed in the last 10 years? Remember when you, when <coughs> Professor Sanders and, and Bashar asked me, you know, you know, tell us the vision, you, you should really look what happened before, you know, before you talk about vision. So what has changed in the last 10 years? Availability of smart and wireless sensors. That is really a big change. Availability of cheap computer and memory power. Availability higher bandwidth, hence better communication connectivity. Availability of easy to use interactive devices. And I will show you some examples of that. Availability of more sophisticated mathematical tools of data analysis, sensory fusion, inferring causal relationships. Okay, so the implications for the social scientists is that we are getting with these sensors more objective observations and combining them with interview techniques. As you know, or some of you may know, that in social science the standard methodology was interviews, you know, questionnaires and so on. Now, they were very subjective, but you cannot completely throw them away. And partly because what you can observe is only the external observables. You can't crawl into somebody's head. So that's the only way how you can get some information uh, about how they feel, what they think. Although I had a delightful meeting with Steve, where is he, I mean, uh, who told me about uh, using EEG and MEG. You know, you can put on your head these electrodes and try to get some idea of what you are thinking connected with some motor control. That is still very crude, and we are far from understanding what the intentions and, and emotions are about. So anyway, enable, so but still, um, enabling to study various social interactions, not only amongst human to human, 
but also human to machine, enabling to collect large scale and longitudinal scale experiments. One nice thing about these sensors is that you can wear them and you can really collect data over time, which was missing in the past, you know, observing people over years, you can do that now. Our interest is in modeling of physical interaction. The, the issue here is level of abstraction. <coughs> so, so the first thing I will tell you is the work that I did with uh, Aaron Ames, who is an assistant professor at Texas A&M, and Ram Vasudevan, who is my PhD student, and myself. So we have looked at the, from human walking motion capture data, we have derived a universal temporal ordering of events and obtained human-based cost to bipedal robotic walk. As in the Millennium Project, using system identification methodology, we have derived discrete dynamics of walking-based constraints derived from contact points of the feet. So I will show you, this is really, <coughs> We have done um, experiments on 10 people, young, old, including myself, and, and this sequence, this discretization is completely invariant. It doesn't change. And you can see the left heel and the left toe. So the, 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 the left heel and left toe are both on the ground. But then as you change to left heel, you, you change the dynamics to move from heel lift to heel strike. And so as you move further, you change. These are the contact points, OK? From left toe and right heel and etc. So this, this cycle doesn't change inde independent of people. What does change, depending on people, is dynamical parameters for each of these uh, hybrid systems. So that's where it changes, OK? So I, here I just described this so we can. So continuous and discrete dynamic. First construct the Lagrangian for the biped where no assumptions on the ground contact are made, and then informs the ground contact conditions through constraints as determined by domain graph. The domain graph is that cycle. <coughs> the Lagrangian for biped together with domain breakdown, which determines the active constraint on each vertex of the directed cycle, allow one explicitly construct the hybrid model of the system. OK? And the guards, which is the when do you switch, is just the boundary of this domain, with the additional assumption that set of admissible configuration is decreasing. So this is a very nice example. And um, uh, here is just a little, you know, the frame of references, how we go about it. We have these three frames of references. And using these frames and respective transformations, as you can see, rotation and translation, we formulate the Lagrange for the biped. So all you guys, you have learned from your control theory is directly applied here. OK, so now um, from walking to body language. So some of you during the morning asked me, where do I go with all of this? And I said, my dream is to really understand body language. And the reason for that is that I truly believe that we communicate quite a bit with our, not only by our face or by gesture, that. Professor Wang has been studying quite considerably, but also with the body. So body language is a form of nonverbal communication, which consists of body posture, gestures, facial expression, and eye movement. But I ignore the, 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 the three others. Humans send and interpret such signals subconsciously. There is no exact agreement among psychologists how much we communicate with nonverbals verbals, but it is safe to say that non-verbals is more than 50%. So this is an important finding because, you know, if we really communicate more with our body more than 50%, we better understand that what it means. 
Okay, so I, so here are some, some uh, static representations of body configuration at different granularity. And you can see skeletal representation, and you can detect quite a bit from these skeletons. Then you can go to higher, um, more, more, uh, more pictorial uh, information, having these outlines. And you can go even here, where you can see that individuals you know, are saying, well, I don't know, or what do you think? You know, there, I sort of stay away from interpretation at this point because I'm scared to put labels on it because a lot of these interpretations, first of all, I'm not yet there to really be able to analyze it precisely, but the interpretation is also very cultural. So it's not unique and you really have to understand you know, with, but, but as you can see, there, is, there are books and, and people worry about it. Well, here is another one. Look at this. I mean, how much detail you need for this, you know, do, is it sufficient to have just the skeleton? Is it, do I need the outlines? Or do I need all this color information in order to really describe what's going on? Well, here is a guy, you see, upset with his girlfriend, I suppose. I mean, that's my interpretation. Again, you see how, how philosophical. And here is, even animals do it, you know? And uh, so it's, it's something extremely innate in our biological system that, you know, when you have a dog, I mean, they are, they, 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 there is an expression of fr friendliness versus attack and, and fear and stuff like that. Okay, so what do we have in terms of computer tools? So we have, we can image people in three-dimensional in real time. We have an algorithm that can automatically skeletonize. So we have these modules for skeletonization. So we are there with that. We can, um, we can track now. Why don't I have it this now? Hmm. Well, it was supposed to sh Something show. Came out for a moment. Huh? Maybe something came up for a moment. Oh, no OK. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. All right, so maybe I have to go back again. All right. So we can, we can uh, track joints for physiotherapy upper extremities using um, these uh, filters. Um, uh, but somehow I cannot get that here. So I'm not going to, no, it's, this is a problem with, okay, all right. So then we have developed a stereo tracking system for detect workspace for muscular dystrophy. We are collaborating with neurologists who are interested in measuring these, um, the muscular dystrophy. I don't know how much you know about it, but uh, this is a genetic problem that kids uh, start to show this. It's a weakness of a muscle. And they start to show it around age five when they, when they uh, start to fall and some of them die at age 15 because the muscle is so weak that it kind of cannot hold, the, the skeleton cannot support it. And the problem there was to, to observe how much these kids can move their upper extremities. And so we developed this system and um, we had to calibrate it with the stereo tracking with with motion capture. And finally, we developed with what those of you who have taken a robotics class, forward kinematics, this is it. From the, uh, from the observation, we can create a, um, a workspace, how far the kids can reach their hands with their arms. 
and you can measure the, the volume or you can, uh, again, assimilation of the data which you can then give the doctors and you can do a, a longitudinal observation of these kids even remotely whether they are getting worse or better in terms of uh, this uh, manipulation. <coughs> okay, all right, now the, as I said, eventually what we want to do is track this kind of emotion and uh, this just shows you that how difficult this is. This has, uh, I don't remember, 20 or so degrees of freedom and uh, you can observe it but then what do you do with the data? How do you describe the activity or, or, or track the trajectories and thereby do the modeling? So this is really the, the issue here. Okay, all right, so now I show you Dextranet is an open source platform for wireless body sensor networks. It supports real-time monitoring and analysis through the use of Spine. Hmm. Spine is an open source framework for distributed signal processing on wireless sensor networks. It provides real-time over-the-air configuration of nodes and allows collection and preliminary analysis of data for further processing at higher layers of the system. We can use Spine to manage a portable Dextranet system, which typically includes several sensor modes and one portable device. With the integration of Spine and Dextranet with the trustworthy health information systems at Vanderbilt, we're able to provide the user with feedback from a physician-supported system. The following demonstration shows how a user can operate the system and receive genuine medical feedback. This scenario shows a prototypical setup of how we can use Dextranet to monitor post-surgery patients. First, the user inputs his weight and blood pressure, which is entered through a website interface of the health information system. The user's activity level is automatically monitored through the use of one spine motion sensor mode, which communicates with a base station mode attached to the portable device that is running a spine server application. The mode is placed at the left hip, which will allow us to estimate a person's energy expenditure using one triaxial accelerometer. Next, the spine server is started on the portable device. Once we see that the server is receiving data properly, the user can go about his daily activity. Energy expenditure in kilocalories is calculated every minute and a scale value from 0 to 255 is sent to the health information servers by a Wi-Fi connection. <coughs> After some time of using the system, the user can get recommendations through the website. User privacy is ensured through system design and the use of both moat level and internet level security. The MOAT radio supports 128-bit AES encryption, which is used to encrypt and create message integrity codes. A 128-bit key is shared between each node and the base station for a given user. This ensures that other nodes and eavesdroppers are locked out of the user's body area network. Communication between the portable device and the health information system is protected and authenticated by public-private keys and a username and password combination. Once the user receives recommendations, he is encouraged to make positive changes in his daily activities. This type of monitoring system is more interactive and immediate than any traditional method and opens up new possibilities for patient care. Okay, I think that's, that's the it. Now, um, one thing I want to mention to you uh, about this particular setup that we did for Wonderbuild that as you saw we have capabilities of taking multiple measurements well in a final negotiation with the heart uh, uh, congested heart um, doctor he said oh I don't want any of that I just want the blood pressure 
<laughs> and when we talked to him about the privacy, he said, oh, there is no privacy. Data is mine. So, you know, this is, these are the real problems of dealing with, with real doctors and, and so forth and so on. Anyway, um, so the next video I'm going to show you is, um, is the game that, um, oh, sorry. is um, health game so here I mean, I was asked to entertain you a little bit, so here it is. <laughs> Many of you probably very identified with this fellow. <laughs> Berkeley Fit is an application for mobile devices that monitors daily physical activity and encourages exercise by incorporating social interaction and competition. Using the built-in accelerometer in the phone, caloric energy expenditure <coughs> can be estimated utilizing an algorithm specifically calibrated for mobile devices. Since the algorithm can function regardless of the phone's orientation, the user can place the phone comfortably into the pocket, allowing for persistent monitoring throughout the entire day. This is Berkeley. Morning, guys. The application also uses the built in GPS to track location in real time and features the ability for users to compete in various types of races in different locations at different times. Afterward, the user will see a summary of statistics, including number of calories burned, total time, total distance, and a plot of the route. The score is uploaded online and is compared with other people's best times, creating a social yet competitive environment. <laughs> Berkeley Fit allows the user to create or join an exercise team with similar levels of physical activity. Teams can see and compare their progress with other teams through a leaderboard with rankings. <laughs> Okay, now the, the last video that I want to show you is, um, is uh, what these, uh, what these um, new interactive devices can do. So this is very recent. This is me. You see, it has an accelerometer and can interact. Right. And then pay station. And 
finally connect. <laughs> jumping okay so these are all these um, modules that are now available and so our interest in f oh excuse me yeah I will okay so our interest in physical games through digital media and their models mechanisms design problem is to implement an optimal solution to a decentralized optimization problem with self-interest agents with private information about their preferences to different outcomes. The concept needed here are social choice function. So there is a serious um, mathematical modeling going on here. Maps agents' preferences into outcome. Outcome rule G maps strategies into preferences and mechanisms implement social choice function. You know, what kind of, how do you choose if the outcome computed equilibrium agent strategies is a solution to the social choice function for all possible agent preferences. A social choice function is Pareto optimal if it implements outcomes for which no alternative outcome is preferred by at least one agent and weakly preferred by all other agents. Um, what I was trying to say here, folks, is that we have these games, we have the information, the assimilation. Think about back to Alex's presentation. So we have the assimilation, and now the issue is how do we design the interaction? And the interaction is we believe the right model is game theoretic. So here is some multiplayer games with the notations. I don't think I really need to go into. So the example of the exercise, as you saw the young man who was trying to use uh, several of these um, uh, input devices, and we plan to do different students, mixed age, gender, weight, and height, each agent plays three games, one with Wii, Kinect, and the other one with that PlayStation individually. This gives us estimate of their individual strategies. Then the outcome is measured by two things, how they accomplish the game, tennis, boxing, keeping balance, and wrath, and the other, how much calories they consume. <coughs> so we have a, a very clear, measurable outcome. The utility function, as you know in game theory, you have to have a utility function, is a composition of the outcome and the strategy, how the kids go about that. Okay, so the game, we will develop this as a tournament game. The first phase will be no prizes. The second phase, multiple prizes. It will be a dynamic game and we will evaluate the learning curve during each interaction. The issue with prizes is how to control feedback during the experiment in order to achieve the right outcome. What you really <coughs> want to optimize is that you want the kids, um, whatever the goal is, whether it's losing more calories or win the game being more, more balanced or whatever the game is, you want to optimize that. And if you have this tournament game, if you have multiple players, you want to make sure that by telling them that they are not the best, that they are not the first, you don't discourage them. And that's really the open issue. So, conclusions. We are interested in dynamical interaction. The interaction is the key word and communication amongst people and cyber physical systems, which can happen locally, but also geographically distributedly. I haven't talked at, at all about the, the geographically distributed system, which I had a collaboration with Professor Narstedt, where we designed these teleimmersive systems where two dancers met, although they each were geographically distributed, one in Berkeley, one in Illinois. They interacted, they danced 
together, interactive in this virtual environment. Um, but, the, but the methodology of how to analyze them is very, very much the same. Uh, what features to take from these people that interact, how to characterize them. We believe that these interactions can be modeled as hybrid system based on observations. For now, we limit ourselves to means of nonverbal communication and physical interaction, because that is what I feel I can measure. I have, have a hard time to crawl to people's heads. The models derived will be predictive, but contextual and dependent on the task. So we have had you know, medical health uh, tasks, and we have uh, games. Uh, so there are different contextual situations. And, uh, and that will also, of course, uh, um, color our, our modeling uh, system. This work has been supported by NSF and so. OK, now the last slide. The emergence of cyber physical and social networks is here. To understand the overall behavior of such systems is a multidisciplinary effort involving engineers, psychologists, public policy, lawyers, and others. CSL is perfectly positioned to <laughs> conduct this kind of research. The stakes are high to understand this system. So congratulations to your 60th anniversary, and thank you. So you give us a big challenge at the end. Yes, I did. So yes. Now's the, now's the time for questions. I should say that following, let's stand up for a minute, I'm sorry. Following this seminar, there's a reception on the third floor in 301. You're all welcome to that. Uh, but we have time for some questions first. So please go ahead. Yeah, yeah please. So uh, if you look at the interactions, yes. uh, texting seems to be hugely successful. Yes but video conferencing has been less successful. Yes. And um, uh, the example that you're showing here, um, the two people competing with each other, yes. to me, they're more asynchronous and somewhat, you know, so somewhat uh, like texting. Whereas uh, two dancers in different locations- It's more synchronous. More synchronous and they probably resemble more Absolutely. video conferencing. Um, do, we, do we have a good insight about what makes first one much more successful than the second one at this point. How do we make the second one as successful as the first one? <laughs> um, well, you, you hit you know, a, a, one of the many problems that we face in this uh, domain, and that is synchronization. I mean, especially uh, synchronization is not the, as big problem if you do locally you know, this um, interaction. But the moment you go outside, geographically distributed, then synchronization is a huge problem, both from the bandwidth problem, from the synchronizing different modalities like sound with, with video, and, um, and of course the, the, the accelerometers, which are lower bandwidth, so that shouldn't be such a problem. Um, so synchronization is, is really a big issue. Um, I think um, Professor Nashter has been working on some of these problems. I think we still have some ways to go and uh, more work to do. Yeah. <coughs> so for example, with the dancers, I can tell you that one of the things we learned was that they were very cooperative and they adjusted to the bandwidth and the, the, the speed of the reconstruction and display and so forth. So they really made an effort. They were cooperative players. Yeah. Now, um, in the teleconferencing, you don't have always cooperative players. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So you, and, you ended saying that you know, what, what you want to you like measuring physical yes. manifestations yes. because you don't want to get, you know, it's easier and <coughs> more reliable. Right, 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 right. Head. However, the game design 
that is strongly, make strong assumption about how people will play, right? And you're implementing in Nash equilibrium, or you're implementing. You, you are right. I mean, they certainly structure the, right. the, the, the game, is structured, yeah. So I guess maybe, maybe to, to close that loop, what, what would be, and, and I'm wondering what, what kind of insight would have in that is, okay, would, instead of making those assumptions and designing the algorithm based on that, while yourself saying, well, I don't, I don't believe I can say that very well, what kind of sensor would we need to learn how people play those games so that we can design, game, design games under the assumption that, that are true rather than just those that make the mathematics pretty or manageable? Um, I think the games are structured by definition. I mean, there are certain rules about tennis. There are rules about boxing, right? So I don't think no, we what can. What I mean is, you're, you're designing. That was at the bottom of your slide too. Uh -huh. like, I'm assuming people play Nash Equilibrium, but they're probably in Kihari, so they're probably not playing Nash Equilibrium. Yet, yeah. I design my system assuming they do. True. True, true, true. Um, hmm. And you are, are, are you asking me how I would redesign the game in order to adapt it to the human? Yes, or could, could I use those, would there be a way to use the sensors as well to inf do basically what you're doing too? That is to infer from actions what people are actually trying to do. Right. So. So are you asking that from the observations, can I predict how I am going to act? And then come back and design the game under the I see. actual real assumptions. I haven't done it, so I don't know. But it's intriguing whether you can really. I mean, it's clear. OK. So it is clear that certain stability will constrain you, OK? I, if I am on right foot, <coughs> you know, left foot, and so so those things I can predict from my, OK, um, from my hybrid cycle. Um, what I don't know yet, how do I combine, you know, this sort of uh, movement, let's say, in tennis or so. And uh, that relates to that diagram that I showed, the complex human motion, how to control that. And uh, people have done tracing trajectories for individual limbs, OK? I haven't seen anything con um, model the complete movement of the, the person. So that's a challenge. Um, and I hope to do that, but haven't done it yet. OK. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you one. Um, you made some reference at the beginning of the challenge of the level of abstraction yes. that you need to do the modeling. And, and we saw some examples of modeling at the different level of abstraction. How, <coughs> how do you feel? you'll determine what an appropriate level of abstraction is. And uh, to what extent, in, in, in what you've talked about, it seems fairly bottom up, that you drive a model and then you right. see what you can learn from it. System to identification. What, to right. what extent will that be driven from the top down, what I want to use the model for in a predictive sense? Good question. That, you know, is determined by the task, obviously. Um, it would be a, well, we have been discussing, would be more a forward um, dynamics rather than inverse dynamics. The, the reason I haven't put that in is because I don't think we know enough about the system of this complexity to really come up with the right parameters. And therefore, I feel more comfortable as a scientist to go from the measurements and do the inverse dynamics. Uh, 
eventually, if I understand enough about the system, even Alex, who has a relatively simple problem, if you think about it, because he just uses position and with respect to time, of course, on a larger scale, he is really using systems identification. Uh, in terms of the walking, uh, what, we, what Aaron Ames has done after took all this data with all the Lagrange, designed a controller for the mimicking the human walking with eye on prosthesis. Okay. Um, we are, so yes, but depending on the task, you know, how much the task can be formulated in terms of these parameters so that I can use them as constraints in either cost function or, or in, the, um, in the switching. Um, I feel uncomfortable to tell, say anything since I haven't done it, but obviously life is never just one way. <laughs> as we know, it kind of goes both ways. And I'm sure we, we will end up eventually, you know. For example, I will say that in this body language scenario, you know, if I know that the context of the, the scene is um, in an office, uh, the interpretation will be very different of this, okay? Then if I, if I am working for the central intelligence, where you know there are these bad guys and I am observing them. So the context will, will, will give a different interpretation. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So there are two in the description of cybernetical systems. They think you know, there were uh -huh. two issues. Yeah. One was that there are sensors. Yes. That put output here to the job somehow. Right. In a, in a and assimilate. Software. Yes, yes. Yeah, the cognitive right. aspect, yes. Now, for each of them, having information that is not normally available to humans, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, information that is available to humans, which is not available to humans. Mm -hmm. So both of these are sources of, uh, in some sense, ripples in the steady state situation that we would like to see in the mm -hmm. system. Any thoughts on the convergence of this, uh, this, this uh, kind of a ripple with whether when it is sort of Convergence right of what? So of a system that we have, cyber-physical system, right. will not properly function if both of these things are not handled properly. So in the long run, what the, the cognitive to? part. Yes. You're right. I mean, in, in the presentation that I made, there were a lot of strong assumptions, namely the people are normal and they drive sanely and not unsanely and, and so forth and so on. And therefore, you can really model their behavior through this Moskowitz's function. You know, it's, it's a very strong assumption, obviously. Um, <clears throat> I haven't talked about it, <clears throat> and uh, I'm not sure I can find the, the video, but um, I have another project where I am looking at the driver in the car with sensors, and um, we have a model of the car, how it drives, and we are developing the model of the driver, especially if the driver is distracted, like cell phone is ringing, okay? And the idea is, just like you saw in the walking, the different hybrid systems, to have one hybrid system for the normal driving, another hybrid system for uh, the, the car autonomously driving, and another hybrid system where the driver is distracted. If the driver is distracted, perhaps you want to switch the control to the car. If the car is sliding on an ice, you want to switch to the driver. And that's what, that's perhaps where this 
But again, it's not clear to me how much the cognitive aspects are coming into that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really have a difficulty to deal with the cognitive aspects because it's not a directly observable. And uh, so eventually, I mean, as I said, people are measuring the brain waves and a lot of the observables, external observables, are correlated, but how weakly or how strongly they are correlated with this intent. Now, can I say that if I do this, that I like you, and if I do this, I don't like you? You know, I mean, it, I can fake it very easily. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's, it's not trivial to make these connections, which many people try to make, but I'm scared to make that. Anyway, I'm scared. OK, go ahead. So last question, but please go ahead. So most uh, assistive smartphones uh -huh. yes. um, are built, or seem to be modeled after a friend that knows everything, so a navigator or an assistant that knows something. But a lot of Right. So a lot of these are kind of social, becoming socially awkward. How do you, do you, have, any, do you have any advice for how we engage? So I'm a control engineer of robotics. How do we engage social scientists? You know, do you have any advice for how we engage social scientists and help design so, uh, you know, better ways? To <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question, how to engage social scientists. You know, my favorite way of putting it, you need a coalition of willing. You know, it's like uh, when Mr. Bush went to, to Iraq, wanted the coalition of willing. In this interdisciplinary collaboration, you have to find the right people who share your goals and are interested in more objective observations and modeling of these social interactions. And not every social scientist will do that, just like I have had a hell of a time with finding the right medical collaborators. I'm slowly getting there, uh, sometimes with help of uh, Gun Carl Gunter. But anyway, <laughs> I mean, it's non-trivial to find the right collaborators in any interdisciplinary field. So that's my advice. Sample. Do the sampling. <laughs> right, Carl? <laughs> I mean, yeah, some, some are very willing and open-minded, and some just say, go away. <laughs> well, I think the time has come to thank Professor Ruzhin Abachi. That was a wonderful...